Welcome everybody again to Restoration, those who are with us uh, here in the sanctuary and those who are watching on uh, the Restoration app or shalomcl.com. We are glad you're with us in uh, any of the ways that you're with us. Uh, We are in the fourth part of a series on the book of Psalms, um, which when you talk about the Psalms as a group, there's an S. When you talk about one Psalm, there's no S. I've emphasized this every week because it is an odd pet peeve of mine um, that people talk about, I was reading Psalms 16. No, you weren't. No. (laughs) You were reading Psalm 16, um, which is where we're going to look today. But we've talked about over the last uh, few weeks, and if you haven't heard the messages prior to this one, I encourage you to go back and uh, watch them. Um, And what we've set up for several weeks um, at the kind of start of the summer, which, you know, the rest of the country, the summer started a long time ago. I don't know if you guys realize that. On Instagram, all my, like, all our friends' kids have been out of school for, like, 18 weeks already, and, you know, it's really, Laura and I went on a date this week, and we were both wearing hooded sweatshirts, and we took a picture of the, by the Seattle skyline, and somebody said, you guys could still wear sweatshirts in June? Uh, and we were like, yes. The summer doesn't start here until July 4th, well, really the 5th right? And it doesn't end until somewhere in the middle of September, which we're kind of a month uh, behind or ahead. I don't know, however you want to play it. If you're a a cup half full or a cup half empty, you can take it a month ahead or a month behind. But um, so I totally planned on wearing shorts and flip-flops this morning. And then I I looked outside and I was like, oh, I got to put pants on. That's too cold. (laughs) Too cold. Um, But the Psalms are designed for uh, worship and they are songs. They're also poetry, um, which means sometimes we take a lot of theology uh, out of the Psalms, and cer- certainly there are theological ideas um, and concepts, but po- Psalms first uh, are poetry, me- meaning they're poetic. And in fact, if you take poetry literally, um, that means you take it as poetry, not as literal as a narrative or a story uh, in the scriptures. There's a different way to take poetry literally um, than taking the way we take the rest of uh, other parts of the scripture as literal. So we've been talking about how there's these um, one commentary set it up as kind of three groups of psalms, the orientation psalms, the disorientation psalms, and the new orientation psalms. And the orientation psalms uh, are psalms of praise. They're psalms about the Torah. They're psalms about creation. They're psalms about the greatness of God. The disorientation psalms are songs which are actually, you know them as lament psalms. Um, The majority of the 150 psalms are laments. And and laments are about pain and depression and anger and frustration Um, And we kind of sidestep a lot of them because they make us uncomfortable. And we've talked about over the last few weeks that the reason why disorientation psalms make us uncomfortable is because in the culture that we live in and the way that we read the Bible now in 2019 um, is to, for some, well, lots of reasons, to make any of those feelings non-spiritual or to make them feel like you're sinning if you're angry or depressed or sad. Um, And it's just not the case in the scriptures. They are, there is a whole array of emotions that God has designed us to feel um, and experience, and the disorientation psalms um, help us to actually say what's on our minds. So last week we talked about confession and the idea that you're supposed to confess things to God, but you also need to confess things to other people. Because if you don't confess things to other people, and they should be safe people, and, and that's probably the hardest to find is because we've all been hurt with by people who we thought were safe that we shared something and then they used it against us or 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 told other people when we didn't intend that information to be out there and we were trying to express it to a friend and so when those things happen we then cut ourselves off more and isolate ourselves and instead of expressing what we feel and actually feeling what we feel we spend most of our time running away from the things that we feel, or pretending that they don't even exist, or worse, making them attributes of demons rather than of people. And while all of these things are connected to each other, 
There is nothing wrong with you if you are sad. There is nothing wrong with you if you have suffered a lot of things and suffering is a part of your story. There is nothing wrong with you. It is, it's okay to not be okay. And sometimes in communities of faith, we, you know, we work hard to put smiles on our face when we're with other believers and because you're supposed to feel the joy of the Lord. And we like conjure up this fake joy because we're trying to pretend that everything's okay. But sometimes it's not. Uh, and the disorientation psalms help us to wrestle through those things. And then the new orientation psalms are the psalms that kind of, when there's a breakthrough, there's, there's two movements, right? From orientation to disorientation and from disorientation to a new orientation. And those two movements in between are happening all the time. So the idea is you're not supposed to stay in any one emotion all of the time. You're supposed to go through a process of feeling different things at different times when those feelings are appropriate. And, well, sometimes when they're inappropriate, too, I guess, because they are feelings. Um, but you're not supposed to stay in disorientation. So in a shift from disorientation to new orientation, there's psalms that talk about the surprise of God coming through and doing things when we were in a season of disorientation, uh, that there was hope that God would do something. But then when he actually does something or something becomes, uh, we, we become aware of, of something n new and an answer to our prayers, if you will, then we find ourselves in a new orientation where we can worship God in gratefulness and thankfulness that he brought us through a season of disorientation. And I, I've been very um, open during this uh, series on Psalms, which is an odd thing, and sometimes it's the way it just shows that God is smarter than us. I plan, every summer, I plan the entire year of what we're going to preach. Uh, so in the next couple weeks, I'm going to take a whole week and plan out all of 2020, what we're going to preach. So I plan to preach on the Psalms sometime last July. Um, and what I didn't know was was while I was preaching on the Psalms that I was going to be in a season of disorientation myself. Um, and I, 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 you know, it's like a, there's the last couple months have been s some serious roller coasters of like, man, I feel great today, praise the Lord, and oh my gosh, I feel like I'm in hell and everything's going to fall apart. Like each, you know, not, not even days, like hours. Like, woo, oh my gosh, not again. Right? Like there's this season. Um, and I think what I'm experiencing for myself as someone um, whose name means God's gift of happiness, Matthew Asher, that's why I call myself the happy rabbi, um, it's not good for your branding when you're not happy. You know what I'm saying? The, ha the happy rabbi who, in parenthesis, is a little bit sad right now. Um, <laughs> It doesn't, it's not good, it wouldn't be good on a t-shirt. But um, uh, what I'm finding um, in this season is there, like in the Psalms, there's always hope and despair, but it's also okay to despair when your world is falling apart. And even if it's not and you just perceive it to be, it's okay. And if you don't pause to experience those things, then you're just going to spend most of your time running away from them. And they're going to keep sneaking up, and we just find more stuff to do. I'm just going to work harder. I'm just going to play harder. I'm just going to do whatever to avoid what I'm actually trying to feel. And in the meantime, God is standing there going, I, I designed you to feel it. Maybe if you just pause to let yourself feel it, then I could do something with it. So the Psalms are, you know, in and out of these, and today I want to talk about Psalm 16, um, and for probably for several years now, um, on, on nights that I have trouble sleeping, um, I pull out Psalm 16 um, and read it, and this is what Psalm 16, and Psalm 16 is kind of a funny psalm because it, it can be one of all three of those categories, orientation disorientation, and new orientation because there's pieces of all three within 
this psalm. Um, so it's a, a psalm of David. It says, keep me safe, O God, for in you I have found shelter. And I said to Adonai, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are noble, and in them is all my delight. As for those who run after another God, may their sorrows multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor lift up their names with my lips. Adonai is my portion and my cup. You cast my lot, my boundary line, fall in pleasant places. Surely my heritage is beautiful. I will bless Adonai who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set Adonai always before me, and since he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. So my heart is glad, and my soul rejoices, and my body also rests secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor let your faithful one see the pit. You make known to me the path of life, abundance of joys are in your presence, and eternal pleasures at your right hand. So I think uh, where I, years ago, I found this kind of psalm when I was having um, trouble sleeping. And, and I think verse 9 is the reason why. So my, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices and my body will rest secure. Um, the problem is it doesn't all the time. I think if you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time um, and, and reading the scriptures for, for yourself, you, you want these things to be true. But often they're not. And these are songs that people like King David and, and others wrote for, for different occasions. And, and I think I've read Psalm 16 up until this point as, as strong confidence. And I'm reading it now as I don't actually feel that confidence, so I'm just going to keep saying it out loud. Like I don't actually necessarily feel like that God is with me the way he has been in times past because I'm in a season of disorientation. And so uh, uh, it's, it, I, I want to say to the Lord, verse 2, I want to say to the Lord, you are my God, and I have no good apart from you. It, it's like, it's, um, it, it's, like it's, it's reminding myself um, that, one, the good that's happened in my life was not just good choices I made. Uh, and the bad things that happen in my life are not, like, neither is, ac- is necessarily your fault or your work, or your, I think when we look at other people, and especially when we live in a world of social media, um, and, and when, when we find ourselves in disorientation, and you're like scrolling through Instagram, which looks like this, um, or one thumb if you're good, you know, uh, and you see everybody's pictures, you, you know that, you know that most of us only post the highlights, like, it's, it's kind of, I, I remember there's been several times where we've, ch- you know, like every, uh, every year we try to take a family picture. And so we have all these different family pictures of our kids uh, at different ages. Um, and the truth is, there was like a horrific fight on either side of that picture. <laughs> of like, sit still, don't put your, hand, put your hands down, smile. You know, like you have this whole, like, just, will you just look at the camera? And then... And then you share the picture and everybody looks happy and people are like, oh, they have such a wonderful family when the truth is, the truth is it's more like an episode of The Simpsons where Homer says, well, you just, you know, like all that happens, but all everyone sees is, and then we start, we wrestle. So when we read, um, we read people's posts, you know, and see all these things, we, we're, we're only seeing the good things. Um, once Stephen Furtick is pastor in North Carolina, um, and, and, and he said, um, it's, we, we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. So we're like, we compare our worst things to why isn't my life like that person? When in actuality, it is. You're just only seeing the good stuff, especially if you follow, you know, like celebrities and people who, you know, it's all part of their brand. So they're, they're posting the, the good stuff, you know, but it's, it's not just on them. We do the same thing. I mean, how many times do you post a picture of like, I just had the worst day, yay, right? You don't. Um, you post the good stuff. And I think there's a depth 
to which we, and when we experience the hard stuff or we talk about the hard stuff, everyone tries very hard to encourage people who are sad. Um, or we try to, you know, make them not sad anymore. Like, we, we just want to say, you, you, sh- you should just snap out of it because the scripture says that you are my Lord and I have found no good apart from you and Adonai is my portion, he's my cup and my, your boundaries are in pleasant places, you know, I've fallen in pleasant places, but what if it's not? What if you're in a season where it's not? And, and I think what we are better, better way to serve each other is when you know people are in seasons of disorientation to just offer to be there. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to quote a scripture. You might not even have to pray for the person right in front of them. Certainly pray for them regularly. Um, But I think we work really hard to snap each other out of things that perhaps God doesn't want us snapped out of because he's trying to show us something or teach us something um, about who he is and who we are. So I'm reading Psalm 16 a little differently these days um, because it's more of a request than it is spoken in confidence. One, I know that I don't have any good thing apart from God. In, in, uh, in verse 4 and 5, it says, As for those who run after another God, may their sorrows multiply, and I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor lift up their names with my lips. So in the culture of the Near East, what a lot of Israelites would do, and happen many times in the scriptures, is God very clearly tells us not to worship other gods. One, because they're not actually gods at all. There's only one God. Um, But when things aren't working out with the God you're worshiping, it's, you know, let's try another one. And there are actually sacrifices and there were altars set up where you would literally pour blood offerings. So when when David is talking about, um, you know, I'm not going to run after gods, I'm not going to, so that sorrows multiply and and I'm not going to pour out drink offerings and I'm not even going to say their names on my lips. For them it was a religious, um, it was religious where that when you found yourself in despair and you felt like God wasn't there, what is the first thing you do? Do you want to sin? Do you want to throw everything away? Do you want to move away from what you have known to perhaps try something else? And part of what David is saying is even though that's in there, I'm not going to say their name, and I'm not going to offer offerings to them, and I'm not going to run after God, after other gods. Now for us in our culture, we're not necessarily, there's, there's not a whole lot of pagan worship happening in the lives of believers. Hopefully. Usually. Um, but we certainly run after a whole lot of things. We eat. We spend. We do all kinds of things that our hearts are in. And when we find ourselves in disorientation, we go to the things that are supposed to make us feel better. Of course, we know after doing them for some time that no matter how many times you do them, momentarily you might feel good, but afterwards you feel terrible. And and so the, the question is why do we strive so hard instead of just feeling what we're feeling and recognizing that God is with us in the disorientation, why do we run so hard in the other direction? This is a human problem. It's a problem that everyone in this room, whether you resonate with, with this right now or in any season or in other seasons of your life, you know what I'm talking about. You might not talk about it that much with other people because, you know, we're not supposed to. Um, but what I'm suggesting to you over this course of going through the Psalms together in this series is maybe you should talk about it more. Maybe you should wrestle with why, what feelings you don't like and where those come from and why you respond to those feelings the way that you respond to them. Because it's all a little different 
for each person. But foundationally, it's the same. There are all these things in our lives and all these decisions we make and the things that we do are somehow connected to things that have happened before and the pattern that we have set up for ourselves that seems to help the most, which we know actually doesn't. But here we are in that same cycle. I told you, if you weren't excited earlier in the service, this is going to make you really excited, this sermon. I can feel I can feel the joy bubbling up in all of you. Um, so verse 5, he says, Adonai is my portion and my cup, and you cast my lot. And, and you know that um, the, the idea of, um, of a cup throughout the scriptures and in Jewish tradition, when on Shabbat, when we say the blessing over the wine and during Passover and weddings and during all these joyful events, we fill a cup to overflowing. Uh, and the idea is there is, well, wine brings joy is where it comes from. Um, and an expression of that joy is a full cup. Uh, and so David is, is saying here in this, um, in this psalm, Adonai is my portion and my cup. He, he's saying not only, back to um, verse 2, I have no good apart from you, not only is what's in the cup from the Lord and overflowing, but the cup itself is my portion. And the portion has to do with an inheritance. And the inheritance in the scripture is always misunderstood by people. Um, we, we read and we go, well, there was only the oldest son was the one who got the inheritance, meaning he got all the stuff. And yes, that's true, but that's not the point of the inheritance. The point of the one who receives the inheritance is with the inheritance, he is then responsible to care for the family. So it's not just that you get all the stuff, it's that God gives you all the stuff because with the stuff comes responsibility of taking care of your brothers and sisters and their families and their children and their children's children. There is an inheritance that is supposed to be passed that helps to take care of people but in our culture, we view it as, well, I just get the stuff. I, I can't tell you how many times I sit with people at the end of a loved one's life, and there's arguments over wills and money and, and all of these things that there, it causes great division in families because people just want the stuff. But the stuff is given with responsibility to take care of everyone else, not just for us to get the stuff. So David is saying... Not only do I recognize that God is my cup, but he's also my inheritance. He is the most important thing. He is the thing that we want to pass on from generation to generation, along with understanding of who God is and how that applies to our lives. But he's saying, Adonai is my portion and my cup, and you cast my lot and my boundary lines. Verse 6, my boundary lines fall in pleasant places. Surely my heritage is beautiful. And I think there's part of it where even when our lives are not in pleasant places, there's hope that God will bring us to a pleasant place. So David is not saying everything is wonderful and everything feels great and, and there's no bad thing in my heart or in my mind because isn't everything beautiful? He's saying, it would be really helpful, Lord, if everything could fall into pleasant places because the heritage you've given me is beautiful. So, I think this is where the psalm shifts. So I will bless the Lord who counsels me. And even at night, my heart instructs me. Which is a weird thing because the Proverbs also say that the heart is deceitful. So why do we want our heart to instruct us at night of all places? Oh, here's what's weird. In the Hebrew, the word is kidney. It's not heart. Heart actually shows up later in the psalm. But in verse 7, it says, it actually says, even at night, my kidney instructs me. <laughs> Which is weird, because kidneys don't talk. But I don't know if you realize that hearts don't either. Uh, and in the ancient Near East, the kidneys were actually the, pl the center of emotion, not the heart. So translators make it heart, 
because in our culture, heart is the center of emotion. But we also know that neither the heart or the kidney have anything to do with emotions. They have functions, but our emotions are here in our head. They're not in our heart, and they're not in our kidneys. They're not in any other body part. The brain is the one that actually functions in emotion, um, but in their culture, in the culture of the ancient Near East, uh, David is saying, even at night, my kidneys instruct me, meaning sometimes that word is also translated as heart and soul and spirit. It's who we really are and who God has made us to be, which we know our hearts are deceitful. We have sin and deceit in us. But if you choose to continue to follow God and fall in pleasant places, have your boundary lines fall in pleasant places, and you keep seeking after the Lord even when things are not all pleasant, then he transforms our heart or our kidneys, and he transforms the way that we would typically deal with something in Yeshua and filled with the Holy Spirit. He transforms our heart so it's not our deceitful heart or kidney, that is instructing us. It's a heart that is given over to God that instructs us. It's his spirit that instructs our spirit. It's his spirit that speaks through us, even at night, where he's helping us to uh, find instruction and seek rest and allow God to be God because we are so willing to put other things instead of God in his place. So verse 8 says, I've set uh, Adonai before me, and and since he is at my right hand, and I will not be shaken. Uh, And there's actually the Hebrew word for shield is in verse 8, and and it's the same concept, uh, similar in the reason why verse 8 says, I've set Adonai always before me, and he's at my right hand, is because King David, who's writing this psalm, had a shield bearer. He didn't actually carry his own shield. He had a sword. And then he had a guy standing on his right side who held a giant shield that covered both of them. And and David, as a warrior and as a king, was somebody who has a shield bearer who's seemingly always on the right hand. So, you know, if you're going to kill a king, you should go to the left, apparently. But, But that's where his sword is. So you don't go to the left. And you don't go to the right because there's somebody holding a shield that's protecting the king. And what David is saying when he says, I've set Adonai before me, and he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. He's saying, God is the shield bearer. He's the one holding a shield that protects to our right side. He is at our right. It's actually later in the New Testament when Yeshua ascends into heaven, he takes the seat at the right hand of the Father. The right matters as opposed to the left in the scriptures, because it's a place of safety and security. And so David is saying, he, he's on my right side. He is the shield that protects me. He is the one that stops the, the onslaught of the enemies that are attacking me. He is at my right side. So, verse 9, so my heart is glad and my soul rejoices and my body also rests secure. Why? Because God is with us, even to our kidneys, and he is our cup that is overflowing, and he is our shelter and our shield and our safety, and even when you're in a place of disorientation, it is possible that your heart could be glad and your soul rejoice and your body find rest because of who God is, not because the difficult or bad things that have happened are your fault. Not because you can conjure up feelings, good feelings, and good emotions and make yourself pretend that everything is fine, but because God is leading you to pleasant places. And here's what's crazy. There's generational pleasant places. As Americans, we just need God to put me in a pleasant place. Because that's what I need God to do. I just need God to fix my problems and my issues now. But what you don't often pay attention to is shifts that God is doing generationally in your family. 
that you are a part of. So I've told you before that my parents were both from very unhealthy, very abusive families. And they made decision in their 20s to become followers of Yeshua. And in becoming followers of Yeshua, they decided to be the parents that they never had. And for most of my life, I've been grateful as I've learned my parents' story as I've gotten older because they protected us from most of that story and then told us as we were getting older what actually happened to them. That then you become grateful that they chose to not do those same things to us. And what that does is set up my children, although I'm currently very angry, my anger and what they are experiencing with me, though difficult for them, is better than what it would be if the generation before me didn't choose to do it differently. And because of the conversations that I can have with my children about these things, it will be better for them and it will be better for their children, and it will be better for their children. But we just want God to do the pleasant places now, but sometimes the more pleasant place is going to be two or three generations from now because of the things that you're struggling through right now and that you are working out in your own life from your own childhood as an adult in 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, that are hard, so difficult for you to overcome, that in some sense you will never overcome, but in the shifts that God is doing in your heart and in your mind, your children will be better. Your children's children will be better. And their children will be better off. Because God is moving generations to pleasant places. It's the hope that we have that even in the end of all things, there's going to be struggle and pain and mourning. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, that even in the end, in the book of Revelation, which also doesn't have an S on it, uh, Revelation, that in the end of all things, when all things are complete, there will be no more mourning and no more crying and no more suffering and no more, no more, no more. There won't be any darkness at all. We will just have the light of the presence of God. They won't, we won't even need the sun or the moon, which God created, to give us light because his presence will be so bright that we won't need the things that he created to show us his glory. We'll just have his glory. So even if you're suffering difficult things now, there are pleasant places to come. There is always hope that there is a pleasant place whether it is for me in this lifetime or for my children or their children or the hope that there will be pleasant places. And it's because of the hope of that pleasant place that we can allow God to do things in our hearts and our minds now so verse 9 can become real for us where it says, So my heart is glad and my soul rejoices and my body also rests secure. For I know, verse 10, that God will not abandon my soul to Sheol nor let his faithful one see the pit. But some of you read that verse and say, but I'm not the faithful one, so I am destined to the pit. And God is saying to you today, I am the faithful one. And I know the struggles of your heart and the struggles of your mind or the struggles of your kidneys. <laughs> and I will still be faithful to you. I will not leave you. Your destiny is not where you are stuck right now. The things that God has designed you for are not what you are experiencing at this moment. He has designed you for so much more. But this moment is important because we feel what we feel and we experience what we experience so that God could prove himself to be faithful. And the longer you walk with God, the more he shows himself to be faithful. The, the more you trust that his faithfulness is real and that he will continue to be faithful. So I know over the course of my life that there were other times, even though I'm in a season of disorientation right now, none of what I'm experiencing now compares to things that I've done in the past. And God should have left me then, but he didn't. So he's not going to leave me now. But it also doesn't mean that I have to be happy. It doesn't mean I have to pretend there's nothing 
wrong happening in my life. Because we can experience the, and feel the things that God has designed us to feel. And the truth is, I've, I've said it every week, and I'll say it here at the end as well. You cannot lead yourself through these things. You need people to walk you through them. In, in most cases, you, you need to pay someone to meet with them for an hour, to help them walk you through what you need to be walked through. And I talk with people all the time as I've been preaching this series. Some people have said to me, I don't need counseling because I have the Holy Spirit. Nonsense. I know you have the Holy Spirit, and I do too. But the Holy Spirit also wants to fix things that you can't fix on your own. And the way that you're going to wrestle through things, if you are willing to do the work, if you're willing to take the time, if you're willing to let God speak through other people into your life and help you see the things that for some reason we're just always last to see. You know, I've shared with a few people like, you know, I, th I think I have an anger problem. And people go, really? Interesting. Like we're the last ones to see it. But in it, God wants to do more than you can hope or imagine with it. But the longer you don't, the longer you work to not feel it, the longer you spend pretending it's not even there, the more nothing will happen. But if you take the time and you're willing to do the work and wrestle through the things God wants you to wrestle through with the help of other people, then what will happen on the other side is your body will rest secure. And God will be at your right side, as he's been even through the times of struggle. But you will understand it differently than you've understood it before. That's where the new orientation psalms come in. Because then the new orientation is, oh my gosh, it, he actually was faithful. I'm like super surprised. Because in the disorientation, I didn't think he was going to be. I mean, I hoped he was going to be. But I pretty much didn't believe he would. And then he did. And now I can celebrate that God is more faithful than I am. So verse 11 is where it ends. You make known to me the path of life and abundance of joys are in your presence and eternal pleasures at your right hand. Verse 10 and 11 also has shades of resurrection where the psalmist was understanding that even though we will die, that there will be life after death and that and that resurrection is inevitable. And the difficult place that you're in, God wants to raise you up. But if you keep trying to do it by yourself and you think you're all you need, you're not going to find what you actually need. There's a song that's been super encouraging to me um, over the last uh, few weeks. And... Uh, I don't know, for 20 years or so, I've, I've found that this guy, Jason Upton, like his songs are major parts of my spiritual life and journey. Um, but he has a song called Mountain to Valley, which is the name of this uh, message. And, and, and these are the words of the song. When I don't know what steps to take, when I don't know what moves to make, there's one thing I can't escape your love. When I don't have the words to say, when I can't seem to find my way, there's one thing I can't escape, your love. From the mountain to the valley, from the desert to the raging sea, from the silent to the city streets, your presence always covers me. And I, this is my favorite sentence in the whole song. He says, I, I'm plagued by your promises and words you have spoken desires that you've placed in me that you faithfully will complete. From the mountain to the valley, from the desert to the raging sea, from the silent to the city streets, your presence always covers me. In hope you will lead the way, in peace you will be my strength, to stand in the midst of a storm and believe in your goodness, Lord. From the mountain to the valley, from the desert to the raging sea, in the silence or the city streets, your presence always covers me. And then this, he just repeats this line. 
You take me in, you leave me out. You take me in, and you lead me out. Right? There's mountains and there's valleys. He takes us in to seasons. He takes us out of seasons. Because his presence is with us in all of them. You take me in, you leave me out. If God takes us into a place, he's not going to leave you there. He's going to take you out. But then he's going to take you into another place. And then he's going to lead you out. And then he's going to take you in, and then he's going to lead you out. You take me in, you lead me out. You take me in, you lead me out. What a journey walking with you, God. Then he repeats, when I don't know what steps to take, when I don't know what moves to make, there's one thing I can't escape, your love. When I don't have the words to say, when I can't seem to find my way, there's one thing I can't escape, your love. From the mountain to the valley, from the desert to the raging sea, from silence to the city streets, your presence always covers me. Your presence always covers me. Your presence always covers me. Let me pray for you. Lord, we need your presence in our lives. We need your Holy Spirit. If there's anyone here in this room or watching and that has never received Yeshua as the Messiah, Lord, I pray that this would be the day that they receive you and make you Lord of their lives so that they can recognize when you take them into a season and when you lead them out. But Lord, there is one thing we can't escape, and it's your love. And we need your presence to always cover us. So would you cover us? And as your presence covered us, covers us, would you help us to see the things that you want to weed out? And would you help us lead us to the right people to help us in these seasons to be able to talk these things out and feel the things that we're feeling and experience the things that we're feeling so that we can be assured even at night when our kidneys speak to us that your presence is with us and that you still cover us even when it feels like you don't. We love you, Lord, and we're grateful that as unfaithful as we are, you will always remain faithful to us. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.